Welcome aboard the Fourth Watch. These uh, podcasts are sponsored by the good people at the Fair Group, of which I, Ned Scarsbrick, am a volunteer. This is a uh, parallel podcast to the presentation given by Brother Greg Kearney at the Fair Conference in 2005. This will actually be a rather short podcast because Brother Greg did quite a thorough job. So, Brother Ned, uh, what do you have to offer that I should listen to? Well, just a little color. I really do like uh, Greg's title of The Message and The Messenger. Now, there are many ways to explain or to teach a principle. Masonry uses what uh, could be considered today as extreme symbolism. So uh, what does masonry really mean? Well, that uh, that depends on the mason you're talking to. Brother Ned, can't you just give one straight answer to one straight question? I'm trying to. Masonry teaches that there is no one definition. Masonry is not a religion. There is no dogma you must believe. Each mason can decide for himself what each symbol means, and each symbol can have more than one meaning. So, how do you know what you're doing if everything can mean different things? Well, that's because it's a club. It, it's a fraternity. It's not a church. Now, it is religious, though, in that the craft takes moral principles from different religions and uses them to unite men together as brothers under the fatherhood of God. So it's like uh, kind of a grown men's uh, Boy Scouts uh, without camping trips. Well, that's that's sort of true, I guess. It is designed to help good men become better men. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, teaching method of ritual that the... um, Masons use, and then Brother Greg did a great job of explaining in detail that this ability of ritual to explain and express complex ideas. Now, if you haven't listened to uh, his blog or listened to his uh, podcast, please do so. I would, I highly recommend it. I would just like to go into a uh, little more detail about the uh, penalties in masonry and that at one time were part of the LDS temple ordinance called the endowment. Across my heart and hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. Now, that's that's not part of masonry. It's not part of the LDS endowment. It's uh, kind of a uh, school ground oath. Guys like stuff like that. They see it as a badge of honor. Girls, uh, not so much. Now, I, I can't talk about the specific wording of the obligations because I agreed not to in the lodge and in the LDS temple. Not because it's some great secret. It's private. It's personal and not something you talk about in public. Oh, here it comes. Brother Ned sidesteps another issue. No, I'm not. Now, would you talk about your intimate relationship with your husband or wife? No. That's ridiculous. Well, what about your finances? No, that's private. Now, that's the point. Some things are just private, and they deserve to stay private. So, uh, what about these uh, blood oaths? Blood oaths, a great shock term. Let's see, could we get more uh, negative Let's see, I got the most negative uh, explanation I can come up with is, uh, is this. The Masonic Temple is the only place I know where I can take my blood oaths, perform my occultic ceremonies, pray to the heathen Masonic God and the Mormon God all at the same time. Now, what if we, uh, what if we gave it a more uh, positive portrayal? I like this better. The Lodge is a place where true friendship exists among men of different faiths who are trustworthy of my confidence in them because of the oath they took in the presence of the whole Lodge. They would rather die than break their word. So if uh, you break your word, is someone going to kill you in some gruesome manner? No. 
Well, are you part of some uh, secret group that will kill those who break their word? No. Well, that's what you uh, Mormons and you Masons teach. No, it's not. Now, here is what it means. Rather than break my word, I would rather die in these terrible ways. It's about keeping your word. Remember the days when a man's word was his bond? That's what the oaths are about. You can trust me. This is the great Masonic secret. Nah, can't be that simple. It is. It's the one main point in all of Masonry. It's also the significant portion of the LDS Temple Endowment. I give God my word. It is the most serious form of the covenants that we can make in the church. Now, let's just take this one step further. In the Middle Ages, there was a common belief taught in the churches that if your body was not whole when you died, you could not be resurrected. This is not true, of course. There is no doctrine to back up this teaching, but it was a common belief. Yeah, so what? Well, if you committed a crime worthy of death, a common penalty in days past, and you were executed in a manner where your body was no longer whole, not only were you killed for your crime, but you also have no hope in the next life because you could not be resurrected. A uh, considerable motive to stay in line with whatever laws would uh, warrant such a penalty. Well, what does this have to do with masonry? The manner of the penalties in the Masonic Lodge are such that your body would no longer be whole. So not only would you rather die in a gruesome manner, you would also lose any possibility of salvation as a resurrected being. Whoa, now that's serious. You're right, this is serious. I think Joseph Smith saw this type of teaching system as an important tool and later incorporated it into what we know today as the endowment. Now, hold on here, Brother Ned. The church does not teach this. You're, you're right, it does not. This is just my view. Don't like it? Don't believe it. This is not a make-or-break doctrinal truth. It's just my view. Now, let's move on to uh, Mason speak. You know, church members have their own lingo, and if you're not familiar with it, you can get lost pretty fast. The first word in masonry that people have a problem with is worshipful master. Now, worshipful doesn't mean someone you worship. Oh, yeah? Well, yeah. In the uh, United Kingdom system of uh, law, there are two basic uh, types of uh, lawyers. One's called a solicitor, and the other one a barrister. I don't care about that. Why are you talking about this, Brother Ned? Well, in uh, England, lay magistrates are called your worship. That's how they're addressed. Like we would uh, address uh, the judge in a court in the United States as your honor, they address them as uh, your worship. And I think in uh, Ireland, uh, a district judge was also uh, referred to as your worship. I think that was uh, before 1991. I think it's since changed. Also in Canada, a justice of the peace is also addressed as your worship. So, worshipful is a honoraria, a title of respect like uh, your honor, not someone to be worshipped. We uh, are, are we okay on that one now? Good. So when I was installed as master of my lodge here in Boise, Idaho, in uh, 2001, I was addressed in lodge as worshipful master, just like Hiram Smith, because he was worshipful master of the Rising Sun Lodge in Montrose, Iowa, before he and his brother Joseph Smith were killed by lawless men at the Carthage Jail. Another term that makes uh, some uh, uncomfortable is the craft, in referring to the Masonic fraternity. This relates back to the days when Masons were part of the craft guilds, like wheelwrights or carpenters. 
We're talking real construction stonemasons here. This is not like uh, witchcraft. Yes, it is. No, it's not. Let's uh, talk about the three basic tenets of Freemasonry. And you tell me if this sounds like witchcraft. The first is brotherly love. By the exercise of brotherly love, we are taught to regard the whole human species as one family, the high and the low, the rich and the poor, who, as created by one almighty parent and inhabitants of the same planet, are to aid, support, and protect each other. On this principle, Freemasonry unites men of every country, sect, and opinion, and causes true friendship to exist among those who might otherwise have remained at a perpetual distance. Relief. To relieve the distressed is a duty incumbent upon all men, but particularly on Masons, who are linked together by an indissolvable chain of sincere affection, to soothe the unhappy, to sympathize with their misfortunes, and to restore peace to their troubled minds is the great aim we have in view. On this basis we form our friendships and establish our connections. Truth. Truth is a divine attribute and the foundation of every virtue. To be good and true is the first lesson we are taught in Freemasonry. On this theme we contemplate and by its dictates endeavor to regulate our conduct. Hence, while influenced by this principle, hypocrisy and deceit are unknown among us. Sincerity and plain dealings distinguish us, and with heart and tongue we join in promoting each other's welfare and rejoicing in each other's prosperity. That sound like witchcraft? So what's the difference between these uh, stone mazes and uh, the mason fraternity that everyone seems to be upset about? That's a good question. As a matter of fact, uh, I'll try to do this from memory. It was one of the things I had to uh, do before I actually became master of my lodge. So let's talk about operative masonry. By operative masonry, we allude to a proper application of the useful tools of architecture, whence a structure will derive figure, strength, and beauty, and from which will result a due proportion and just correspondence in all its parts. It furnishes us with dwellings and convenient shelters from the vicissitudes and inclemencies of the seasons, and while it displays the efforts of human wisdom, as well in the choice, as in the arrangement of the sundry materials of which an edifice is composed, it demonstrates that a fund of science and industry is implanted in man for the best, most salutary, and beneficent purposes. That was hard to memorize. Let's move on to speculative masonry. This is what people get so concerned about. You tell me if this sounds like some secret combination. By speculative masonry, we learn to subdue the passions, act upon the square, keep a tongue of good report, maintain all private communications, and practice charity. It is so far interwoven with religion as to lay us under obligations to pay that rational homage to the deity which at once constitutes our duty and our happiness. It leads the contemplative mason to view with reverence and admiration the glorious works of the creation, and inspires him with the most exalted ideas of the perfections of his divine creator. The speculative mason is taught to examine every action of his life but a square of morality, seeing that no presumption or vain glory has caused him to transcend the level of his allotted destiny, and that no vicious propensity has influenced him to swerve from the plumb line of rectitude. Now, does this all sound like a secret combination or some form of a witchcraft? Well, no. Now, if what you say is true, it is true, you can read it in the Idaho Monitor, which is a, a book that all Masons receive when they pass their proficiency as a Master Mason. Okay, uh, then what does uh, being part of a secret combination really mean? I suppose that there are some men in Freemasonry who use it as a secret combination to uh, hide evil, 
but that's not the intent and the purpose. Now, Brother John Lynch of the Fair Leadership gave what I consider a great answer to the question, what is a secret combination? It is any loyalty that prefers people or organization over principles. It does not require an overt set of oaths and purposeful ill intent. Something as simple as the police blue shield, where police support each other no matter what, even without promises to do so, constitutes a secret combination. I agree. I think that was a great explanation. Another term that uh, you hear from Masons on a regular basis is trestle board. Now, in the ancient craft guilds, a trestle board was used to lay out plans for the workmen to carry out the construction efforts of whatever they were building at the time. In the fraternity today, a mason receives his own personal trestle board when he becomes a master mason. Now, in North America, we receive our set of plans or trestle board to carry out the building of our character. Some call it the uh, Masonic Bible. Actually, it's a, uh, a King James Version of the Bible. In Idaho, it's uh, what used to be called the uh, Large Family Bible. It's about 8 by 10. It's, uh, it's a beautiful uh, edition. Now, the Bible presentation has an interesting dialogue to go along in the ceremony. Now, I suggested a few minor modifications now, because this is not actually part of the Idaho work. It's something that we do in our lodge that's voluntary, doesn't, doesn't have to be done. Now, you tell me if this wording is part of a secret combination. The Masonic Trestle Board. Here is your book of plans, a representation of the complete set of plans given to man by God. Here you will find a plan to guide you, to comfort you, to sustain you in any contingency in joy or in sorrow, in riches or in poverty, in fair weather or in foul, the answer to every question, to every need, can be found between the pages of your trestle board. How you will choose and use these plans, my brother, is not for me to say. That is something you must work out for yourself. You may find the answers in the Ten Commandments as laid down by Moses. Perhaps, the inspiration of the Psalms, as written by David, will inspire you, or you may find your answers in the Koran, Book of Mormon, or in other writings of holy men who are moved upon by the Spirit of the Almighty, or the wisdom found in the Proverbs of King Solomon will lead you, as it has been said, he was our first and most excellent Grand Master, or you may find by example the example of that perfect and most successful life lived 2,000 years ago by a humble carpenter. But let me tell you this, my brother, and I say it with all sincerity, whenever you turn to the great book for your plans, it will never fail you. That sound like a secret combination or some cult? Not to me. You know, some time ago I was uh, sitting in sacrament meeting next to the bishop and uh, before the meeting started, he was looking at my Masonic ring, and he said, uh, what does that uh, G mean uh, inside the symbol of the square and compasses? I said, it stands for God, who should be the center of our lives. And the square is a representation that we should square our actions by the square of virtue, and that we should uh, use the compasses to circumscribe our desires and to keep our passions within due bounds toward all mankind. And then on one side of my ring, there was a trowel. And I said, the trowel instructs us to spread the cement of brotherly love. And on the other side of my ring is the plum. The plum is a, a symbol of rectitude, for we should never allow any vicious propensity to tempt us into swerving from the plum line of rectitude. Well, he was impressed. So was I for remembering all that stuff. My brothers and sisters, the teaching system of ritual can be a great tool for good if we will allow its lessons to become part of who we are. 
one last symbol here that's actually not part of masonry. That's something that uh, I made up. You tell me what you think of it. It's called the sprig of acacia. The sprig of acacia has a significant part in one of the rituals. And I took that symbolism and uh, gave it another meaning. After someone has become a master mason in my lodge, I asked the uh, worshipful master to bring the uh, newly made master mason forward. And I uh, say unto him, uh, My brother, after your first admission into a lodge of ancient, free, and accepted masons, the first question asked you was, In whom do you put your trust? For all good men and true who are to be made masons must answer, In God. In remembrance of that trust, you will recall that in ancient Israel that the Ark of the Covenant, by divine command, was made of acacia wood, overlaid with pure gold, and placed in the Holy of Holies of the Temple as a constant reminder of the ever-living God in whom they put their trust was in their midst. And I take this little sprig of acacia pin that's on my jacket, and I place it on the left lapel of his jacket. And I say, I take honor in presenting to you this sprig of acacia. May it be over your heart, a constant reminder to you of that same God in whom we put our trust, and that his presence is in our midst. For God is the same, yesterday, today, and forever. And then I say, so say we all. And then the worshipful master wraps everyone to stand up. And I say, together, brethren. And everyone says, so say we all. Now that's not officially part of masonry. It's something that I made up for our lodge. There are other lodges in the country that have special little presentations that they make up for their own. Let's try to take symbolism and not paint it with such a wide brush stroke that it can only mean one thing in every circumstance all the time. If we let symbolism have its work, it can teach us deep, deep meanings that actually become part of who we are. My brothers and sisters, I see the story of Jesus walking on the water in the 14th chapter of Matthew as a great symbol to teach us that every morning we should meet the Savior, focus on Him and His skill and His love and His ability to guide us into eternity. I want to thank you for your time. I appreciate it. <laughs> 